Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to begin this new series of uh, what we've called BXC Direct. And really these uh, direct uh, webinars are designed to go a little bit deeper into some of the issues around what's facing acupuncture and how we work together as a community to achieve what we want. Um, these directs are also an opportunity for us to have conversation about what our values are, what we actually we really value as well. And so both of those can really help us inform what we perceive as value and how we get value from our membership body too. So it's quite fitting that we're going to start off with a conversation about value. So in this, uh, let me just find the uh, controls. There we go. So in this presentation, we're going to be talking about the BXC and quite often it's, uh, uh, we commonly say the BXC is going to do this or the BXC has decided to do this. Well, actually we are all the BXC. Uh, what the BXC is, is an organization that you elect some governing board members to decide how to spend the money if your membership fees for the benefit of us all. So really it's a collective thing. Um, the governing board are your representatives and they tell me what the priorities are and I try and implement them as a CEO and with the help of the staff. So sometimes there's a sense that, well, the BXC is up there and they're doing things. Actually, you as the members, you're up there and you're electing the governing board to tell us what to do. So really, ultimately, we're all working together. So this is a discussion about how our um, funds are allocated and the, the collective decisions that we've made over uh, many years and um, to really go into depth on um, how and why uh, certain decisions have been made. So really, this will be dis discussing value of our membership, but we're really going to answer a lot of the important questions that members have asked uh, many times, frequently asked questions. Questions like, what does the membership fee actually do? Does it need to be at this level? And how is it that other organizations seem to be able to charge less? So we're going to address those questions head on, as we are with all the BXC Directs, we're going to be answering the questions that have been asked many times. And in this presentation, it's going to be an opportunity for you to see the whole picture. As many of you know, I worked for many years in another professional membership body, the Register of Chinese Herbal Medicine. And now I've spent four months in the British Acupuncture Council. And as a practitioner myself, I've been able to see from the inside out how these organizations work not just as a professional CEO, but also as a practitioner. So I, I've got the same kind of questions in my mind as I think you do. And I've been trying to find those answers. And so today, this is an opportunity for you to have a sense of what I've learned over this time. And really, the reason why I've got a picture of an iceberg here is, as we know, the smallest part of the iceberg pe peeks out over the water. And that's the bit that we see. But there's a huge amount that's underneath the water. And so we have this, we might look at an iceberg and think that it's this small peak, but actually it's this larger thing. And I've always thought professional membership organizations a little bit like this, that above the water, they're the functions that most members are aware of, the things that we see, the things that are visible. And then there's this huge thing that's underneath that a lot of members aren't uh, that aware of or not aware of the whole picture or not aware of how much it takes to do them or why we're doing them. And so today we're really gonna go into that. We're gonna see the whole iceberg. And an example of some of the things that you might, members might be aware of that are on top of the iceberg are the private health insurers we get from our membership. Um, obviously the practitioner directory is something everyone knows about. Events, conference and CPD are publications like Accu and Ichom our member resources, the support and real-time support that the BXC offers and discounts and things like that. These are all things that I think uh, uh, people are aware of and people notice and they're great benefits and we're gonna really work hard to continue delivering them at a very high quality. But it might surprise you to know that this is, the, the, the huge amount of the organization is devoted to other things and, and what are those things and why are they important? That's what we're gonna go to 
uh, discuss in this presentation. Um, and with that perception of and understanding of how the whole organization works, you'll be able to understand the deep value of our membership and what that is. And at the end, you'll be able to ask me any questions that you like. So uh, hopefully you'll get a lot of answers within the presentation, but anything that's left over, please feel free to ask me at the end. So how do we assess value when it comes to our Chinese medicine professional membership organization? Well, it's important to understand the past, the present and the future. The past, we really need to understand what we have already and what it took to build it. For the present, we have to understand what it takes to maintain it. And I think one thing that's really important and something that a lot of doesn't occur to a lot of people is that it's often very exciting to think about the things that we might be able to get in the future or something that we, we've just got, a, a new achievement. But sometimes it can be forgotten all the achievements that we've made throughout the past. And once we've achieved it, we still have to work to maintain it. So when the first colleges went through accreditation, when the first time we had the accreditation body, that was probably quite exciting, I imagine. I wasn't around then, but I imagine it was quite exciting. We still have an accreditation body, and it takes an enormous amount of work and funding to maintain it. And the BXC is the only non-college funder of the British Acupuncture Accreditation Board. We'll talk about that later. So finally, we need to understand what it takes to build on this and how to push things forward for the future. So all of these things go into our perception of value. And I like to use this metaphor of a Jinko tree because just like Chinese medicine that's been here for millennia before, before us, and it's only we only get to learn it because there's been generations and generations of uh, amazing practitioners over thousands of years that have passed it down, put the work in for the future, holding it, holding that medicine for the future and passing it on. And then in this country, we have about uh, something like 60 years of history of people dedicating their lives to learning and teaching this medicine and passing it on. And that's what we inherit. And it's a little bit like this tree because this Jinko tree in Kew Gardens was planted in 1762. It was there before all of us were born and it will be there after all of us pass away. And in, in between this, someone has to look after it. We can imagine that this large tree on the left is like Chinese medicine from East Asia. And at some point we took a little sucker from this and we planted it in the West. And on the right, what we've got is like a teenage tree. So this is the tree that we're looking after now. This is what we've all inherited. And our job is to look after that tree. So we're like gardeners. All of our the members are gardeners taking care at, and treating this tree well so that we can pass it on to the next generation too. So that's really, I think, one of the most important ways that we can look at our membership, that we can look at what we're trying to do here. Uh, we're trying to sustain that tradition going forward. And to really understand all the different aspects of how we, um, all the responsibilities we have and all the different ways that we can create value with for ourselves and for future generations, uh, there's a huge amount that goes into that. And today I'm going to give an overview, but actually the whole BXC Direct series uh, will give much more detail on a lot of different aspects. So for example, we're going to do a uh, direct in um, October on the PSA and regulation and the value of regulation. In November, NHS Integration Month, we're going to give a direct on all the opportunities within the NHS that are, are coming up now, only made possible through all the hard work of previous generations. And then in 2025, we're going to do some focus fo make some focus on research on education and we're going to really flesh out all these different categories but today will be the overview of uh, value of the work that we do so today i'm going to give you two kinds of answers about where our money goes and what it does some of those answers are quite exciting things like all the opportunities in the nhs and everything that's that's happening right now and then some of the answers, they're not particularly exciting, but 
what they have in common is they're both true. And it's really important for us to understand the truth and what it really takes to run an organization. And so today, both of these answers will have the, the, the you'll be able to hear the truth and, the, the, and you'll be able to evaluate it for yourself. And it's only when we have the truth that we can actually make the best decisions for our future. I remember a time when I was working in my clinic and I had a patient and I'd seen that patient for a couple of years and I had made some progress, uh, but I felt really blocked and really limited. One day I asked the, question, the patient a question I'd asked them every single time they come in, what's your frequency of urination? And they told me, oh, it's really frequent. It's, uh, it's about 10 or 12 times a day. I said, oh, that's interesting. Is that new? Because you, you hadn't told me that before. And she said, oh, no, that's been going on about five years. I said, but I've asked you that question for the last two years every time. And how, how is it that you only just told me? And she said, well, I had so many symptoms. I didn't want to burden you with any more. <laughs> anyway, the, the point of that story is, is that for two years, I hadn't had the full picture. I hadn't had the truth, which meant I couldn't make the right diagnosis. Uh, my diagnosis is always slightly off because I didn't have the full picture. And it's the same with our membership organization. We, we need to understand the reality. We, we need to orient to reality. Otherwise, we can't make the best decisions for our future. And whether the reality is exciting or the reality isn't that exciting, it doesn't really matter because then we can make the best decision for our future. And that is exciting if we're making the good decisions. So that's really what we're going to be looking at today. So let's go right to the heart of it. What are these underwater iceberg costs that aren't immediately apparent to members? Okay, so I've put them into three categories. The first category is what it actually takes to do the minimum standard of regulation. So I've deliberately emphasized the words actually, actually and minimum here. It's actually because uh, there are there's many different ideas out there suggesting that you can do the minimum standard of regulation in different ways. And what you'll see today is that's not really that true. The minimum standard, there's really only one way to do it. And so we'll we'll see what all that means and then what it actually takes to do that and why the BXC is doing that while other bodies may not be. The second question is uh, the actions that the BXC do to support the future. So just like the Jinko tree that we started out with, the BXC makes a, a huge amount of investment and has done over many years in supporting the future, handing on what we have to the future generations. Again, something that you may not see in other bodies. And then the final point is actually some realities about the costs of managing a membership at this scale. And these are actually things that I've only come to learn in, in the last few months. And they're, um, they're really important points to make, and they're the reality that we have to understand of what it takes to run an organization, and we'll go to those in, uh, towards the end. And what's really important is that these areas also happen to be the most important areas for uh, our whole mission. And again, you'll see why as we go along. They also happen to be precisely the areas that competitors don't do, which makes it a little bit of an interesting challenge for us because when one of the things that really attracted me into working for the BXC is that having worked with it closely for a few years from the outside, I realized that for you could say a number of things about the BXC, but you, you could always say the BXC was always trying to do the right thing in the right way. Absolutely true from what I've seen from working closely with the BXC for many years. And when you're trying to do the right thing, you will address this whole iceberg. And uh, even the things that maybe members don't have a, a huge knowledge of or understanding of, um, but uh, you'll do them anyway because they're the right things to do. And when competitors don't necessarily do those, they just do the things that are visible to members, it makes it quite hard sometimes to compete because we're doing the responsible thing, um, but there are others that are that may just be doing the things that are uh, immediately visible or noticeable to members. Um, so um, at the end, once I've been through all these three points, um, I'll do a cost breakdown of the whole BXC. So you will see uh, all the um, uh, all the details. Um, I'll also compare 
the fee to other equivalent organizations. And there'll be opportunity for more questions. So is everything we spend strictly necessary? Could we be more efficient? And then you'll have the opportunity to ask your questions. Before we finish, we will get to the exciting part, the exciting things that we can do together as a community if we come together and, and really get behind the right way of doing things. So starting off, we're going to be talking about the R word. The R word is regulation. And I think like uh, many members, when I first graduated, the word regulation really didn't bring me alive at all. I remember people talking about regulation when I first graduated and it, well, it didn't really provoke any kind of reaction in me. I didn't really have any kind of um, opinion about it or thoughts about it. And then I got drawn into working for the RCHM uh, for many years, about 10 years, and then to the BXC. <clears throat> and as you work more and more in these organizations and you see the people around you who deeply, deeply care about regulation and the people I respect, I'm like, well, hold on a second. Maybe there's something in this. Maybe there's something really important about it. And then I started to really understand as soon as I took, got into leadership roles. What happens is you realize how everything that we want comes from regulation, from good regulation. We'll explain that in a moment. And so over time, people who work in this organization, in the organizations, realize how important it is to deliver absolutely everything else. And so there's a tendency to talk about it a lot. And I can understand from the uh, impression of members, it was like, well, do we really want to be regulated all the time? What does that mean for me? And I want to really bridge that gap so what we can, un what we can understand today. And I think it's important to note that we... In these, uh, when we're trying to promote uh, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, we can talk two languages. We can talk the language of our tradition, which is what really brings us alive. It speaks to our heart. It's what drew us in. We know that this deep tradition, this this absolutely a fantastic medicine, um, and we want to preserve this. But we also have to speak the language of the UK as it is in 2024. We need to speak the language of the world. Uh, it, it's it's a completely different language, but it's a language which uh, builds trust, unlocks doors, and unlocks opportunities. And that's really the language of regulation. And so it's not that we have to choose one of these. We have to be bilingual. We have to speak both of them. And that's kind of really the point of today. Now, regulation, uh, it we can kind of divide it into two things. Sometimes these things get confused. Regulation actually creates more safety, but it also projects the perception of trust and safety too. And they're both really important. We have to do both. Um, regulation makes the public more safe because it can, they can choose practitioners who are better trained and uphold higher standards of, um, of professional conduct. But it also makes you more safe because if in the rare case that a complaint comes in against you, or if there's a legal case made against you, the fact that you've joined the highest standard body and that you uphold all of these standards counts massively in your favor, which makes it very hard, even if there's a complaint or even in the extreme case of a legal case against you, it makes it very hard for someone to actually make that successful because you've taken the enormous step of doing the training that you've done and demonstrating that by belonging to the body that's high in the whole, holding the highest standards. It also represents the profession very well, but it also communicates trust. So it enables us, this regulation enables us to project this. And this is really, really important because the professional world, the institutional world, the world of the government and the NHS, they notice this is a language that opens doors. And uh, this is a very important thing to uh, appreciate. Now, we're going to go into the whole area of regulation and the professional standards authority in, in, in deeper detail in the October BXC Direct. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail today, but just important to note that all the things that we want, that we, we want a um, good range of private health insurers, we want to we want to support our safe, safe and legal practice. We want to have credibility on a global scale and a national scale. Um, we want to pass something solid onto the next generation. Importantly, we want to secure traditional acupuncture's place in the future. This is a very key one because uh, I've been talking to a lot of different people inside our sector and outside our sector. 
And what's clear is acupuncture is going more and more mainstream. The only question is, is who is going to own that? Who's going to speak for that? And we all very passionately feel it should be traditional acupuncture. It should be acupuncture, which is grounded in the grand tradition of, uh, of uh, Chinese and East Asian medicine. And the only way that we can advocate for that uh, is to get ourselves in the room. And the only way we can get ourselves in the room is to project good standards of regulation. So here is the point where regulation and tradition meet. Because without regulation, we can't have that voice in the room. And I can tell you that uh, over even the last few months that I've been uh, in place, I, I've been to meetings um, that the Freshness Standards Authority uh, has run, where you have um, the chief pharmaceutical officer of Wales or the head of nursing, really serious people, politicians, and our PSA membership, as I say, gets us in that room. Now, if we're not in that room, we're going to have people who practice acupuncture, maybe without traditional backgrounds, speaking up for acupuncture. And we won't be part of that conversation. So as I say, regulation helps us to have that uh, important voice right now as acupuncture is growing. It also supports the future of research. Research opportunities often only happen when they pass ethics bo uh, boards. And if, you're, if you haven't got regulated practitioners who are um, running the research projects or the or the uh, practitioners who are doing the clinical trials, you don't get past the ethics, um, the board. So, uh, or they don't carry as much weight. Um, and then that goes into our global networking and public trust as well. So here's one of the most important points I want to make today, that there is only one way to achieve the minimum standard of regulation. So we're going to talk about the minimum standard here, not anything over and above what we need. And what do we mean by the minimum standard? The minimum standard is the absolute minimum you need to be able to say anything, anything about the membership of your practitioners, right? What I mean is the minimum standard that you need to say you can trust this practitioner. If you lack any one of these pillars, you can't say that. And we'll go through why, why that is. So I've identified about six here. There's, you could say that there's a few more, uh, but um, these it boils down to essentially this. So the first one is accreditation and education. Very simply, you have to set a standard for your education that people have to meet. And then once you set that standard, you have to enforce it. So colleges will have to meet those standards. Students who go through those colleges can gain admission to your, to your body. And students who don't go through those courses can't. Just very simple. I mean, I'm, I'm only just making very self-evident points here. And Barb does a fantastic job of being flexible to accommodate the needs of colleges and of students, but also maintaining high enough standards to carry enough weight to be taken seriously. And that's a balancing act that goes on uh, constantly. Uh, but what what we've you know what British Acupuncture Accreditation Board has managed to achieve is finding that balance, understanding what the outside world needs to see, what boxes need to be ticked for us to demonstrate that trust in our education and accreditation, and then giving the colleges the flexibility on other areas uh, um, equally. And as I mentioned, British Acupuncture Council is the majority funder of Barb, and that means you are. Your fees are, when I say British Acupuncture Council, that's all of us. Standards and codes. Now, that sounds doesn't sound particularly exciting. It's one of the non-exciting answers. However, funnily enough, it is something that we should treasure. If you have any idea what it takes to put together standards and codes, you'll know that it's an enormous amount of work, enormous amounts of expertise, and an enormous amount of staff time. And if it's an enormous amount of staff time, that means your fees again. And it's not just your fees. It's 30 years of PXC fees of past members that have built these things up over time. And so, you know, when if there's a situation where, for example, another organization just takes codes from another from 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 the BXC, well, there was enormous amount of investment that went into those. And so there's a little bit of an illusion that those codes are coming for free. They're not free. They're built up an enormous amount of your investment and your and your time. Um, as I say, 
they take a lot to 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 build but they're very valuable so they're part of this tree that we inherit and we passed on to future generations and they're continually updated as well membership management this is something that i didn't really understand anything about till i started working in these organizations membership is complex why is it complex because you've got a, a large number of people in all sorts of different categories membership categories um, with all sorts of different needs, insurance needs, um, and in uh, uh, their their ongoing training needs. Um, we get inquiries every week, we get many, many inquiries um, every week about all aspects of membership. On top of that, uh, when we have to work out how um, standards to admit people and to evaluate whether they can still continue to be members, these are always evolving things. Uh, I talked about the, the barb accreditation, but if someone, for example, uh, studies in a different country, how do we match that standard? And the really important thing about this is, is that all of these questions, they take time. If you really want to properly engage with them and enforce a standard, and by the way, if you don't enforce the standard properly, you're not doing regulation and therefore you can't have the trust and therefore you can't have the benefits. If you really want to engage with those questions, you have to devote resources to that. You have to devote personnel to that and staff time. That's why we have a membership uh, department currently of three people to manage 3,000 members. Uh, you need though that personnel to be able to do that. So you, you can ask yourself, if, if an organization doesn't have that personnel, are they actually dealing properly with, say, ab admission requests, or are they just kind of fudging it? Um, so... Uh, professional conduct. So professional conduct, again, is one of the necessary pillars of uh, regulation. You have to have a, a process where people can complain and you have to treat those complaints independently and fairly while also giving support to practitioners and standing up for practitioners um, and um, supporting them in every way they can to, to have their... Um, uh, you know, to, to, to have their protections as they go along. Uh, and that's why professional conduct goes hand in hand with member support. So what you'll see is that in a properly regulated um, organization, that all the issues that come up in professional conduct are then fed back into member support and CPD to help members not fall into uh, difficulties that might have arisen for other practitioners. So, um, this is something that really uh, sometimes professional conduct is seen as a difficult area of membership, but actually I think it can be really seen as something where you can deliver a high level of support for members too. And the last one is governance. What does, gov what does governance mean? So I'll explain a little bit more detail what governance means, but ultimately, if you have no minimum standard of governance, you have no oversight, which means basically whatever you claim about regulation, even if you claim you have the other five things, you can't demonstrate it. There's no trust in that process. So you can't claim to be a regulator. So what does that mean? Well, this is the governance structure for a company, but also for a regulating body. And we're both, the BXC is a company and a regulating body. So, you might be surprised to see the membership's right at the top of this structure. So the membership is the boss. You are the company members. Now it's important to say that you're company members of the BXC. As a full member, you're a company member. And that means you get a vote on the company of the British Acupuncture Council. And it gives you legal rights over the company. You're not a subscriber of a service. You are actually a full legal company member when you become a member, a full member of the BXC. That gives you the power to elect the governing board, uh, but actually, and to also stand for the governing board, it also gives you the power to recall directors as well if you don't think they're doing a good job. Now, the governing board needs minimum standards. It needs a minimum number. It can't be one. Um, actually, it should probably be over three. In the, in the BXC, it's at a nice standard kind of professional number of nine. That's five practitioner directors and four lay directors. And the lay directors get an extra layer of oversight because they're uh, somewhat external to the profession too. So they give an external uh, validation of um, uh, an oversight of our processes. 
So um, what else do you need? You need democratic elections. Um, and if you don't have democratic elections, then, th then there's no oversight. You can't actually, there's no power to elect or recall the directors. You also need term limits. It means that you can't just elect someone and then they are the director for life. So in the BXC, we have three-year term limits and uh, then you have to be re-elected and you have a maximum term of two. So some people will serve for six six years, but that's it. They, they can't stand again after that. And that's important to maintain this continuous oversight. There's also a duty to manage conflicts of interest, also enhanced by a larger board, because a larger board means that the, each board member can be aware of the conflicts that other board members have. And there's kind of a mutual um, support in helping people to, to deal with those conflicts of interest. So the governing board is my boss. The governing board has the power to recruit or dismiss the CEO. So if I'm not doing my job or I'm compromised in some kind of way, the governing board can fire me. And the CEO has the power to recruit or dismiss the staff in the same way. So there's an accountability that goes all the way down through the organization. If you don't have this, as I say, you can't say that you're a regulator because there's no oversight on the regulation. You know, as the CEO, for example, what's to stop me from just admitting all of my friends and, and you know, getting rid of all the people I don't like? Uh, even though I say I might be a regulator, there's, there's no one to check on me. In this organization, I have the governing board to be account accountable to. Uh, and they, they can scrutinize absolutely everything I do. And they do. Um, and then the uh, in the opposite direction, you've got the accountability. So the accountability flows upwards. The staff is accountable to the CEO with their annual appraisals. The CEO is accountable to the governing board with my annual appraisal, but it's actually constant. My accountability is constant. There's four governing board meetings a year, um, which I have to report to the board. And it's the board's job to hold me to account. It's the board's job to scrutinize everything I do, challenging everything I do, um, where they think that, you know, to really get to the detail of like, is he is he actually doing the, a proper job which lives up to the requirements of the membership? But then the governing board are accountable to you. The governing board present everything at the annual general meeting to the membership. So um, this very important governance and accountability structure is essential for regulation to be able to call yourself a regulator. But it's also something that's very, very um, apparent to the outside world. And you can see that from the documents that are filed in Company South. The governing board, our governing board also signs up to the Nolan principles, which are seven very standard principles of uh, public good service. Um, and as I say, so coming back to regulation, right? So if you lack just one of these pillars, you can't claim to be a regulator. And the BXC does them all, and they take significant investment, and they take significant um, operational investment. And so it's important to think, if, if you're looking at another organization, um, these questions should be asked. Do they really do all of this? And if they don't, what does it mean if they're also claiming to be a regulator? Does that really show us up in a good light? Because it's really important to note that it's very clear to the outside world, as I said, to the gov professional world, government world, and institutional world, if you're doing this stuff, particularly governance. And the example I give is that there's been quite a few occasions when I've been talking to people from the professional world, um, either um, in different kind of institutional bodies or in other kinds of professions. I'll mention that I, re I work for the RCHM or the BXC. And the first thing they do is go to company's house, download the articles of association and read them cover to cover. And then I'll get a, a strange question from time to time. They'll ask me about some detail about the article association. I'll say, oh, you downloaded and read that? That's not uncommon in the professional world. So people can see how you're constituted and the kind of oversight that you have in your organization. So that's the minimum standard. And the, I want to say the vast majority of what we do is for that minimum standard, but the minimum is substantial. You, 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 as I say, you lack one of these pillars. It's not that you're just doing a different standard of regulation. You're doing no regulation at all. So what extra does the BXE do to 
actually come up to the standards of the Professional Standards Authority. As you may know, we are an accredited, accredited register of the Professional Standards Authority, which gives us an, an extra stamp of approval that we're doing all of our regulation correctly. And the reality is, is that actually we don't do a huge amount more than what is a very accepted minimum standard, because the accepted minimum standard is al already enough to prove that you're doing the right things. And just to evidence that, these are the nine standards of the Professional Standards Authority accredited registers. Um, uh, so it, there's the eligibility and public interest, management of the register, standards for registrants, registrants is us, members, governance, managing complaints, education and training, management of risk, communications and engagement, and equality, diversity and inclusion. And basically we're doing all of that anyway. Um, so we have to match our, the standards. We have to prove them to the PSA. So it costs us um, about £25,000 a year to be uh, a member of the PSA. That's about £10 per head um, uh, in terms of your membership fee. And then um, in terms of the staff, we do have to devote staff resources to uh, annual PSA reaccreditation. Um, so, uh, you know, an outside estimate, you might say that it's around about £30 extra maybe we spend on the PSA per head but for that we get something substantial um, so just to, to illustrate that as I say the costs of just the minimum standards of regulation are the substantial bit a big part of that iceberg right and I say if we don't do it don't do any part of that we can't make a claim about our, uh, how trustworthy we are and then there's a bit of extra that we put on for the PSA there and that's staff and governing board time and the annual accreditation fee. So I'm not going to go deep into the value of the Professional Standards Authority today because I'm going to go deep into that in the 23rd of October, BXC Direct, uh, all about the trust we project as members. And that will be, um, I'm going to be, it's going to be an honest evaluation. So um, there are things that we would have hoped the PSA could have uh, achieved for us. And uh, some of those they haven't quite delivered. However, I think you'll find that there's an incredibly strong case for us to continue on PSA membership uh, in light of that. But it will be an honest evaluation. And then on 13th, 13th of November, uh, there will be a, a, a direct on the strategy for NHS integration and I'll be joined by Research and Policy Manager Ian Appleyard. That's part of our NHS integration month. And you'll see the key part that the PSA regulation has played in opening those doors and continuing those opportunities. But just as a summary, very quick summary of the PSA. Um, the PSA already has helped us in these areas. So because we're PSA accredited, G GPs can refer, they can refer to PSA accredited registers, which they can't refer to other pro professionals. The NHS website has a direct link to our practitioner directory through the PSA. So it links to uh, the PSA for acupuncture and there's only one body on that PSA page is us. You click on that page and you go directly to our practitioner directory. Um, we have the largest range of health insurers at the BXC. Um, we also, with the PSA, we get what's called equivalence with other health professionals, which means that there's a, um, a duty for us to be provided a certain minimum level of status and benefits as other health professionals. And we're using that equivalence to advocate in a number of different areas, which we'll go into in the next uh, PSA, uh, in, in the PSA Direct. We're gonna be talking about NHS integration later on, interesting current project that we're involved in and the possibility of future projects. Um, our status is uh, very high. So I'll, I'll put some links in the chat um, a little bit later on, um, but there's actually a link to the NHS employers page where it specifically explains the value to NHS employers for um, PSA accredited registers. And as I said, it gets us in the room, it gets us in the room with in those discussions, having those important discussions to protect our future, protect in, in traditional acupuncture and make sure that, that is the, the traditional acupuncture gets in the, in, in the conversation and not other kinds of acupuncture. As I say, it also promotes our research. So we'll be talking about that a little bit uh, later down the line. So with regulation, just coming to the end of this bit, why don't all other organizations do it? You know, why, why, if it's that important, why don't they do it? Well, A, it costs money. And it's not immediately obvious. As I say, it's not that thing that picks that peaks up above the water that catches everyone's attention. 
It also takes a great deal of expertise. And because you have to do the governance properly, it, it can't be autocratic. You can't have one person um, telling everyone, uh, running everything, telling everyone what to do. It's something that when you're actually having to collaborate with people, you have to find a, a point where, where you have common agreement and you have to work together and uh, find middle ground. And that requires a kind of skill and cooperation. That means that you we all work together as a membership. Um, and it's not as easy, but it yields better results if you get it right. So that's number one. What it actually to, takes to do the minimum standards of regulation. Number two is uh, a, a part of this underwater part of the iceberg is the actions the BXE takes to support the future. So as I've mentioned, the British Acupuncture Accreditation Board is mostly funded by the British Acupuncture Council. And this is really the heart of what we do. And, and next year, there'll be a BXE Direct on Education and Accreditation. We'll go deep into that. And you can answer, ask all your questions again as well. But it's part of this tree that we're looking after. This is what the reason why we're able to get here in the first place. And it's what we pass on to future generations. Um, in addition to that, there are other things that we support. We support uh, the European Journal of Oriental Medicine. And there are some exciting directions that we're, we're going to be talking about with EJOM over the next year. And then there's also the global community, our global network, and supporting organizations like the European TCM Association, uh, ETCMA, which is there for us to come together, the high standards bodies around the world to join together and really start to have a bigger impact in the global conversation, which then filters back down to the UK. And you'll notice that, you know, again, the BXC is the only um, uh, you know, UK member of the ETCMA and that's for a reason. Okay, so um, finally, we're gonna talk about the reasons why um, there are significant costs of managing a membership at this scale. So many of you know that I uh, was uh, RCHM president and then I was RCHM CEO. And the RCHM has 300 members and a turnover of 80,000. The British Acupuncture Council has 2,830 members and a turnover of 1.15 million. So if they both meet minimum regulatory standards, how is that happening? So why is, why is the British Acupuncture Council paying this amount and the RCHM paying that amount? Now, one reason for that uh, is um, that the BXC is a PSA member and the RCHM is not a PSA member. But that doesn't, we, we already know that only accounts for a certain amount of uh, money. You know, um, in money terms, probably about 80 or 90,000. So it's not insubstantial, but it doesn't account for the rest of the money, does it? So what what is going on? Why is the British, why does the British Acupuncture account, a Council cost this amount to run? Um, and it, it's down to really the bottom of those columns. So the RCHM is largely voluntary run. Um, it's only got part-time staff and many of the staff are paid well under market rate. I mean, up to the point where they're really just uh, honorariums rather than actual wages. Um, some people have got uh, one or two people have got slightly higher wages, but still probably under market rates. Well, the the uh, the BXC, um, the, it, well, the governing board are, are working more voluntary capacity. There are various people working in voluntary capacities. The governing board are remunerated slightly, but not really at a, at a, at a market wage level. Um, and then there's nine full time staff, and then four part time staff currently will be going up to five. Um, so why is that? What why does the BXC that structure and the RCHM another structure. And this is a question I asked myself coming into the BXC because I've run the RCHM and I'm like, well, uh, you know, can, is there, there, could we apply the model of the RCHM to the BXC? So the question is, RCHM is 300 members and the BXC is 3,000. So almost it should be opposite, shouldn't it? We think, shouldn't there be economies of scale if we grow from those numbers? And the answer is actually, feels counterintuitive, but going from around about 750 at the maximum to 3,000 actually has significant reverse economies of scale. I'm going to explain that now. Again, not an exciting answer, but a true one. Okay. So it's only when you go up from about 3,000 upwards from where we are now, going up when you start to have those economies of scale, and we'll explain why. 
So between somewhere between 300 and 750 members is uh, you're going to have to start to have your first full-time member of staff. Why is that? Well, the we already talked about the role of the membership department that deal with all of those inquiries and they deal with admissions and they deal with all the complexity of managing those, those numbers. And just remember, we have three full-time members of staff in our membership department to cope with that workload. So at some point, you're going to need at least one full-time member of staff. Now, as you can run a voluntary organization if people work part-time to some extent. So if we have uh, only part-time roles, then people can do, say, three days a week in the uh, VXC and then, or even two days a week or half a day a week, and then the rest of the time running their practice. But the more that number goes up that you're working, the less time for your practice and then the less volunteers you're going to have until you have no volunteers because you just need full-time staff. And so even if the BXC wanted to, it couldn't be voluntary because no one's going to volunteer to work full-time for an organization for no money. It's just not going to happen. And by the way, there's a risk to having a voluntary run organization as I run work, work with the RCHM is that continuity is always a worry. It's always a worry that you're going to have, have to have enough motivated and um, uh, uh, talented people to do that. And so continuity is something that is talked about constantly in the RCHM and, and it's a bit more assured in the BXC because we have the right structures in place. So um, what staff do you end up needing? Well, you need, I already talked about membership department. We've got three in the membership department. Think about the scale and the number of inquiries that come in. Um, think about the increase relatively, the number of complaints that are going to come in. You're going to need much more time. Someone actually dedicated to running the professional conduct department. Uh, if you're offering real-time support, which the uh, BXC does, answering the phones, answering emails, you're going to need people, more staff doing that. Um, and your community grows. So all the needs of the community, all the amazing things that are happening in the community are growing that need attention and need support from uh, the British Acupuncture Council. You quickly need a lot more staff. And as with those staff, when you get a full-time professional staff member, this is, uh, you, you, you need to pay a market salary and you have to market benefits. Um, you then have recruitment costs you then, um, which can be substantial. If you ever worked in a company, you'll know how many, um, how much um, is dedicated to human resources uh, uh, to be able to run an organization where staff well-being is looked after, but also the, do it in a way that's legal and doesn't get you into trouble so that you might get sued, for example, by an employee. That's where HR comes in. You absolutely need it. And then lots of other things scale with members. So um, IT costs, equipment costs, uh, events as well. So if there are public events you're doing, like the conference, and now the staff need to go, they need to meet the members and we need to, everyone needs to be able to interact and you have to fund that. So there's a lot of things that scale with a number of staff uh, in terms of costs. And I, one really important point I want to make, and this is something again, that I've only really discovered in the last um, uh, few months uh, really in this year, is that membership is an industry. And this website you're looking at here is the website of Memcom, which is a conference, if believe it or not, for professional membership organizations. So anyone who works in a professional membership organization goes to this conference and they all talk about membership. And what you realize is, is that professional membership bodies, it's, it's a whole structure. It's got its whole character to itself. Uh, they all talk about um, how to how to um, support members with like CPD, for example. They talk about publications. They talk about how to get more members on, how to keep members. Membership is its own industry. And what you may not know is that many people make their careers in membership. Many people, that's they, they, they want to be a communications director for membership bodies, or they want to be a membership manager for membership bodies, or an events manager for membership bodies. And that that's a whole career path. And what happens is, is that they'll get experience often with a smaller body. And once they get a certain level of experience, they want to move on into a better paid or higher um, uh, management role. Um, in a smaller organization, they can't move up. So they have a real incentive to move on, which means that the paying our staff a market wage is the only way to get the quality staff, um, but also to make them feel like they want to stay as well. 
So uh, to provide value to both our staff and to our members, all of our wages are benchmarked against industry standards. So that means that we can maintain a staff um, that's going to do the work. And, and the longer staff members are on board, actually, um, the more they grow into that role and the more they can deliver. So it's really in our interest to try and keep good staff on for a longer time. OK, so what's the staff that we need um, to <laughs> what spread of staff do we need to deal with the whole iceberg? And so um, I've just named a few departments here in the BXC. So our membership department's got three. Um, safety and research, we've got safe practice manager and research and policy manager. Publications, we've got publications manager. Professional conduct, we've got professional conduct officer. Uh, in events and CPD, we've got our learning and events manager. And then communications, uh, uh, two, two part-time staff in communications. So um, this is the minimum spread that you need to run a professional membership organization. It's minimum number of departments that you need, whether you've got 300 members or you've got uh, 30,000 or 60,000, um, you need to address those functions with what you have. And so really what you're looking at here is actually a very efficient scaled down version of what you need. And some of you may know that the BXC has actually downsized. It's uh, both its physical office presence, it's downsized and it's staff numbers. So it's gained a huge number of efficiencies, particularly over the last, say, five years or so. Um, now, with that number of staff, now that you've got that number of staff, you need some other things. You need a CEO to manage them because now you've got 14 staff. Who's going to manage those staff? Um, and you need a finance manager because the complexity of the organization now needs to be tracked on a full time basis. Systems and operation manager and office administrator. So that's how it all expands into what we have. And this isn't a, a, a bad thing. In fact, it's it's a good thing. Um, uh, oh, just to mention that it, this doesn't even count uh, the staff that run EJOM and the staff that are on the British Acupuncture Accreditation Board, which are both funded by the British Acupuncture Council. Um, and so that builds up to uh, the first breakdown here that I'm going to give you of our costs. So staff costs cost around about 50% of the organization. And that's why um, the, there is a very good reason for that. Any organization that grows beyond, say, 750 members or so will very soon stop being a voluntary run organization and professional run organization. There's no way around it. But that's a mark of success. It's something that should be celebrated. It's, it, it's a reality of the world, but it's because we are successful. It's because we've grown to where we are and it's a really good thing. And also having good staff practices is part of regulation. It's also something that bodies and, and professional bodies that look at the BXC from the outside notice. Uh, a, a number of situations where um, people have given a positive and favorable treatment to the BXC because they understand that it has good staff practices. It's also something that the Professional Standards Authority looks at too. So it's not only something that we should be doing, we should be treating staff well. And we all got into this profession because we care about people and we wanna do the right thing. So we should extend that into the way that we run our organizations. But it's also something that we uh, we benefit from because it shows that it, it's noticed. It's noticed that we have a good structure, a good professional structure organization, and it creates better sustainability. It's a false economy not to to um, to uh, put too many strains on, on on staff and things like that because you'll lose the staff, you'll lose good staff, and then you're in worse shape. Okay, so when we grow to five thousand or ten thousand, which I hope we do then I think we get the economies of scale. Because if you look at that minimum spread, well, it's mostly covered. And so we might have to have one or two staff here and there, but probably not proportionately to the number of members that we're we're, we're growing from at that point. Because currently we're, we're kind of mostly just about covering our costs with our income. But as we grow, well, you have more members, you have more income. So you will actually get those economies of scale. And you might ask, could we grow to this number? Well, the physios have 65,000 for reference, right? So a much, much larger organization. And they're obviously benefiting from way larger economies of scale. And I think uh, I was told it's got around about 80 staff. So they have grown a huge amount, but you know, I guess their functions have grown a lot as well, but we'll look at that in a moment. Okay, so here it is all together. Um, 
we've we've looked at the staff is roughly around about 50 percent it's just slightly under 50 percent of our costs the next biggest chunk is your professional insurance um which comes in around about 70 percent roughly about a sixth of the uh of the fee the 610 pound fee is uh is your professional insurance uh next biggest wedge uh is our funding of barb um which is a really key um feature but again Real efficiencies have been found found in Barb over the last few years, and um, you know uh, it's it is a very well run organization. Um, and then what else have we got here? So um, let's go around from the bottom. Uh, EJOM is about three percent. The PSA is about two percent. Our contribution to the ETCMA is actually is a bit under one percent. Um, uh, our ethics department costs about three percent. There's um. Um, we have to pay for uh, uh, for panels, for a little bit of legal work and things like that. Um, our events, our conference um, tends to run a little bit of the de deficit. However, we're very happy to say that our conference this year came in under budget. Um, but events do cost us um, a bit. Um, our PR spend um, is a, a certain amount. But again, we hope we really, really get the value from that. Um, we spend about 1% of research. Um, here about, uh, I think there's like 2% on ACU, on producing ACU. And then um, our IT costs are quite substantial at 6%. Um, HR, about 2%. And then the governing board there, that little wedge is about 2 or th it's about two or 3%. So it, it, it's, if you think the governing board is, is um, costing the organization a lot, it's not. But we need to invest in it. Um, and that's the governing board plus a certain amount of expenditure on committees and things like that. So that's the kind of breakdown of how the organization, uh, 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 how the costs are allocated and the reasons why they're allocated this way. Okay, so um, we're almost at the end now. Thank you for your attention. But um, what about the top of the iceberg? Okay, so we talked about this. It's also very, very important. The things that membership members notice, very, very important. We, we have the highest number of private health insurers. We have a directory linked directly from the NHS and with GP referrals, which gets us uh, the last month uh, calculation is, um, and this is an average roughly as well, it's about 22,000 monthly visits to our practitioner directory. Um, we have our conference and CPD and events. We have ACQ and eJOM that we provide to members included. We have our extensive member resources. Uh, you know, we have um, CPD, free CPD for members uh, on clinical things, on safe practice, um, and on marketing. We have our real-time support. As I say, you can phone up the BXC and uh, get through to somebody and you can talk to us or you can email us at, with various bits and pieces of support. And of course, there's a number of different discounts if you find the uh, member offers page in the um, member section. Okay, so big question. So if this is what it takes to run an organization, then equivalent organizations should be charging around about the same, right? That's logical. Okay, so then we would need to compare it to an equivalent organization. Now, there's no point us comparing our organization to some to an organization that's not doing those big parts of the iceberg. They're just doing the visible bits. So we have to really compare like for like. And that's organizations that are seriously doing the regulation side, that are seriously supporting the future and things like accreditation, um, and that are have the same kind of scale challenges as us as well. So really, those ones that hold those three things, we're way closer to the statutory regulated professions, um, the physios, the osteos, and the chiros. Now, I understand they're statutory regulated. They're a different status to us. And that's not my point here. My point is, is that the actual work that they're doing is equivalent to the work that we do. They're actually doing regulation. They're actually doing um, the support of members and they're actually advocating for those members as well. So in terms of what it costs to run the organization and what they're going to charge, there's an equivalence there. So let's see how we compare. Now, it's important to note that in the statutory regulation professions, this is what happens when you become statutory regulated is the organization split. So the on the one side, there's a government operated body or government um staffed body which is their regulator so with the charter society of physiotherapy it's the healthcare professions council the hcpc which actually regulates a number of different professions 
And then things like with the osteopathy, there's the general osteopathic, osteopathic council, the chiropractic is the general chiropractic council. So on the one hand, you have your regulating body. And on the other hand, you have your voluntary membership body. Say voluntary because you don't have to be a member of that body. But the voluntary membership body does things like advocate for the profession, which the regulator doesn't. And the voluntary membership body, I think it does things like they support members. They support members with CPD, with events, with conferences, with information and things like that. They create the community. Now, the BXC does all those three together because it's voluntary regulated. It's not split. The BXC uh, regulating bit and the support and advocacy bit is all together. And there's actually an advantage in that because um, it means that the um, the regulatory bit never gets too bureaucratic because it's always tempered by all the other bits, right? So um, it actually, you maintain that authenticity. But anyway, so the BXC has a combined fee of 610. So what we have to do is we have to add up the two fees because the BXC does all of those functions together and then we can see the equivalent. So with physiotherapy, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy is 442 pounds, the fees. Uh, the regulating body is 116 and that's 558. And then we can do the same for osteopathy and then chiropractic. Uh, there's actually uh, there's actually two voluntary bodies that I found. And you can see they are up to 908, 1148 and 1450. Now, uh, I'm not 100 percent sure because it was a little bit difficult to tell from the um, uh, from the website. But I do know that the Charter Society of Physiotherapy includes professional membership insurance, professional insurance. But I think it's high, it's very possible the osteopathy bodies and the chiropractic bodies don't include uh, their insurance they have to get that on top um, but uh, don't quote me on that but it seemed like that from the website but even if they did include it you can see that we compare extremely favorably to osteopathy and chiropractic and we're a little bit more than physiotherapy but do remember that the physios are sixty-five thousand members so they're benefiting substantially from those economies of scale that, that, that we are struggling with at the moment in terms of we we are the way I describe it is the BXC is on the smallest end of large. That's where we are. So when we grow from here, we get those economies of scale. But still, even accounting for that, the BXC is compares, you know, it's it's in the same range, you know, as uh, the physiotherapist. OK, so could things be run more efficiently is a key question you may be asking. Right. And that's my responsibility. You can hold me to account for that. Right. But um, uh, I, I've been through the budget many, many times since I've come on. There's a question I'm constantly asking myself, but it's important to note to begin with that fees have not risen in 12 years. And when I say they've not risen, they've actually fallen because of inflation. It quite, it quite put it quite, put quite simply, they've, they've dropped by about a third or put another way, if they've been rising by inflation, they'd be around about in the 900 range right now. So because of that, the fees have been dropping. And in order to absorb that, savings have been made year on year on year on year. That means that, you know, there was a time when the staff numbers were over 20. There was a, a time when we had a full physical office and now it's mostly remote. So a huge number of savings have been made over this time. And so from this perspective, um, you know, 610 pounds is actually, it's actually incredibly reasonable price. For, for for a professional membership body in 2024. Um, and the reality is, is that everyone knows what inflation is like. And as I've already explained why it is that our salaries, uh, in order to sustain the organization, have to maintain their kind of market, um, market equivalents. Otherwise, we can't run the organization. So fees will have to rise at some point. Um, we there's no decision about that but it will have to happen and i really hope that if that decision has to happen and it's done to try and support and sustain all this amazing work that we do all together by the way this is all of our um our efforts and our fees and um that if that if that is the case in the future that you know you can refer back to the things that i've talked to you here or if, if you um have a conversation with another member and they're trying to understand why it is that that might be happening we can, um, uh, you can make some of the arguments that have been made uh, today. Um, so that's what it all uh, looks like. Um, we're gonna move to questions in a moment, but I just want to finish with just to say that what we focused on here are true things about what it takes to run a membership organization. But 
really there's a real exciting future for us when we can actually come together and leverage what we have and build on what the past has given us. And in November, we're going to have NHS Integration Month. And you're going to hear about a project in Gloucester, which was only made possible quite explicitly because we're holding those standards and because we're a PSA accredited register. Um, the primary care network manager said it to me in those words, unprompted, that it wouldn't have happened without the PSA accreditation. Um, on 30th of November, we're going to talk about this developing strategy, how the opportunities to move into the NHS are kind of opening up and how we respond to that. Um, uh, I'll be doing that BXC Direct with Ian. And then on 20th of November, we're going to come together as a community and just hear from everybody who's been working in the NHS um, over the last uh, you know, few decades. We had so many members working and advocating for us in the NHS, and we can leverage that. We can come together as a collective conversation to develop a really exciting strategy for the future. And um, we're really on the cusp of finding real integration in the public sector, real integration in the private sector, and also integration globally, coming together uh, east and west and, and culturally too. I think there's an amazing opportunity right now for us to come together and really come together uh, um, east and west um, to really communicate the depth of what we do. And you'll be hearing a lot more about this as we go forward. Find a real career structure for acupuncture, something that's really solid and clear and clear career, career progressions. And also coming together as our in our vibrant community and really leveraging that and building more and more on the community that we have. Because when we come together, there's really nothing, nothing that we can't achieve. Um, and that community will be built on with a few new initiatives. There's this initiative of community conversations where we have the important conversations where you take the lead, we shape the future together. And the next ones will be on the 16th of October, we're going to have a, a Zoom where all members can come together following on from the successful student vision boards at the conference. I'm going to invite all members, actually BXC and RCHM, we're going to come together and we're going to talk about our visions, our hopes and aspirations. And this is your opportunity to have your voice heard and to let the, uh, the leaderships of each organization know what your priorities are and what your hopes are. And that can inform our future strategy and, and the, the the BXC strategy for the next five years will be, develop, be being developed next year. On the 20th of November, uh, we're going to have this NHS conversation of, again, elevating the amazing people in our community who've been taking the lead within the NHS. Um, and in conjunction with all of that, another way for us to have visibility of our community and go a little bit in depth into the deeper thoughts from our members is the video series we started called Cultivating Tradition. Um, there again with the, the tree that we're all looking after. Um, there's already been a couple released on our YouTube channel. You can see them linked in e-news. Uh, the first one was with Chintia Scorzon and there's one just released with Volker Scheid and there's more to come uh, and they'll be coming on a regular pace. So the fi final thing to say is the tree says thank you to you because your membership fees have contributed to what we have today and not only what we have today but what we're going to hand on to the future and so much of the investment it may not be completely evident when it's when that investment goes in when we're going to yield that result um but what you'll see when we got we talk about the nhs integration is that it's only made possible with decades of work and now it's bearing fruit and who knows what the investment that we put in now might achieve in 110 years. And again, I say that's really something that's so hardwired into what Chinese medicine is. We have this thing and it's important for us to hold it and to pass it on to future generations. 